for 10 seconds, I had a thought, oh my gosh, is this real? Are they real? Before I kill myself and before I tell Susan about the mission and kill her, I better find out if this is real. Jan Broberg, welcome. You are on the edge. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> I am very well. Thank you. Man, we've been trying to get this going for some time, haven't we? We keep missing each other. Now we finally, we're finally here. We are finally here. It's great to see you and to be here, Andrew. Thank you. Oh, it's very, very exciting. So I'm, I've been wondering how to sort of do this. because I think a lot of people will have seen the documentary on Netflix, uh, um, a Netflix abducted in, in plain sight. Um, I suppose maybe depending on how you feel, would you like to sort of roughly go over your story a little bit for those who haven't seen it? And as a reminder for those who have. Sure. Um, so in a nutshell, we met a family, uh, mom, dad, five kids at church when I was nine and we became best friends. We did hundreds of activities together. Uh, everything from picnics and boating and snowmobiling, and they had a trampoline, they had all the fun toys, and uh, we spent a lot of time at their home, rode our bikes together. The oldest four were boys, same ages as me and my two younger sisters, and then another little boy and, and a baby girl, and um, literally felt like this would be a family that if my parents died, you know, I could be raised by this family. That's how much we loved them. That's how close we were. And the whole time, apparently, the um, target was to eventually kidnap me and sexually assault and abuse me uh, over a three, almost four, actually, year period of time. So at age 12, I woke up after taking what was I thought my allergy pill to go horseback riding with the father of this family who uh, had a client, so he said, uh, for his furniture store that we were going to go pick up some furniture. And he said, but I'll take Jan horseback riding. He has horses. And I'd been there before. I'd been horseback riding before. And, um, and again, this is like my favorite uncle. This is like somebody I was so close to. Um, and so eventually my mom said, okay, but get her home, you know, early because it's a school night. And instead he gave me my allergy pill and I woke up groggy. It knocked me out and in the back of a moving motor home strapped to the bed by my wrists and my ankles. And in my ear was playing a, a, a voice that sounded, now remember this is 1974, October of 1974, big time in the history of all time when Roswell and UFO sightings and lots of science fiction movies, you know, Star Trek and Lost in Space were on TV and, and we were going to movies that were all around that same theme. And when I woke up this voice in this little intercom looking box was calling me by name. Well, she wasn't calling me by name. It was female companion. It is time for your mission to begin is what it was saying. And then it would give me short staccato phrases of instructions, telling me I was special, telling me they had been watching me since I was born. They knew me and that eventually what the whole, um, I guess you would call it brainwashing scheme that he used was that I was to have a child to save this alien planet, that I was half alien, half human, and that I was, my mother's name happens to be Mary, and that I was the child that would save, that would give the planet their savior to save their planet. Now, all of this came out over a period of time as this man drove me into Mexico, was trying to get me to South America, and I was not found for about 45 days the first time. 
And then I came back home. He was, he pled insanity that his depression had gotten the best of him. I never talked because I thought that these aliens were watching me all the time. I was the female companion. They had told me he was the male companion. He would be the father, the sperm donor, the whatever of this child that would save the planet. And of course, he was mortified and he was such a good actor. Oh, my word. How can I do this? How will we do this? And the whole thing was premeditated and planned uh, by this um, pedophile who was also a father of five who had molested girls before me. I know this now and girls after me and um, a lifetime of crime in this kind of way. And after I was home, back to the story, for about a year and a half, contacted by him. He was in a mental institution for a short period of time. But all this contact I kept having with him or with the aliens, with the alien box that would show up in my bedroom, Lots of intimate little stories here that I won't go into. You have to read the book or watch the documentary or the series, um, which is coming out this fall. But um, he kidnapped me again a second time at age 14. I was 12 the first time, 14, barely had turned 14 the second time. And this time he took me to uh, California. He enrolled me in a private boarding school. And so I was very much off the grid. And again, the entire time for four years of my life, I really thought this story was true, that they were watching me. It wasn't until I was found the second time, which was almost four months later, and brought home. Another year and a half goes by. I'm turning 16, which was the magic age. I was supposed to have the child to save the dying planet before the age of 16. Of course, none of the rules applied. I was still pre puberty. I was, but I wasn't all human. I was part alien. So the rules were different for me and my body and everything. I hadn't gotten pregnant to have this alien child through all the rape and all of the abuse and sexual assault. I was at this boarding school for almost four months. It's, you know, uh, been quite the ride. He would come take me out. He had told the nuns, it was a Catholic boarding school, that, of course, he was my father, that he was a CIA agent, that we had escaped Lebanon crisis. That was the what was happening at that time in our, in our history, and that my mother had been killed in Lebanon. So to be sure, not to tell anyone if they might come looking for me that I was there, because then they would take me, torture me to get to him. And so, of course, the wonderful nuns at the Catholic school had several visits by several private investigators and um, police officers, detectives, before they actually believed them and said, yes, the picture of that little girl, that is her. Her name is Janice Tobler. We thought, they're like, this is Jan Broberg. She's been kidnapped by this man. And they brought me home. So after I was home the second time, um, the brainwashing was pretty severe. I never, ever told anybody about the aliens, about the mission to have the baby, about the sleeping, relaxing pills. That's what he would call them. You have to take your relaxing pills about the medication and certainly nothing about him ever harming me or touching me or anything. Never, ever during this whole period of time. So after the second time, the communication coming from the alien box or from him, which would show up at times in my bedroom, was less than the first time. I was getting older, but I was still pre-puberty. The idea was that I had been told was that I was half alien, half human, and so was my little sister, Susan. And so if I could not have the baby to save the dying planet by the age of 16, then she would be taken and she would have to fulfill the mission. Well, of course, I didn't want that to happen to her. I followed all the rules because there were many threats. If I were to talk to a boy at school or have a relationship with my dad, then my dad would go missing or be killed or my sister Karen would be blinded and it was amazing how much the brainwashing centered around threatening my family members because children and young people will 
not tell you, even if you've had a wonderful, open childhood like I did. I had parents that I talked to all the time. Um, they listened. We ate dinner together around the table. But immediately when the right threats are put in front of a child who who cares and loves her family, they won't tell. So when people think, oh, we'll teach our children, they'll tell me. And I'm like, no, they won't. Anyway, back to the story. <laughs> I did not have the first moment until right before my 16th birthday. I was at a drama camp because I love theater. I love acting, always had since I was really young. And at that camp, a boy had bought my ice cream at the cafeteria line where we would go eat. It was on a university campus and we would go eat there, go get treats there. And he paid for my ice cream. And I thought, oh no, my dad's going to be dead tomorrow. My sister, Susan, will be missing. Karen will be blind. The dogs will be dead. I don't know what will happen to mom, but I knew something terrible was going to happen. Because, because he paid for your ice cream? Yes, because one of the rules from the aliens from the thing was I could have no relationship with other boys, including my father, that they were all not good, keep them out of the way so that the male companion could be the only person that would have access to you to impregnate you for the mission to have the baby for the alien planet. <laughs> so I know it's laughable. Go ahead and laugh. It's fine. I should just say that I, I don't think anybody would judge you badly for this at all. I don't want you to think that. Nobody would laugh. Uh, on this podcast, we've had lots of stories of surviving abuse in all sorts of different ways, cult thinking and ideologies and stuff. And, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the things I often mention is um, the writer of Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan, Arthur Conan Doyle, who's supposed to be the, the master of deduction and rationality and logic. He believed in fairies uh, as, a, as an adult man in a time when, you know, it wasn't normal to believe in fairies. That, you know, even incredibly intelligent adults can be led to believe things if, this, if the, the situation and the circumstances are right. So I don't think anybody would be judging you at all. And I'm so, I'm so sorry. Let me just say, actually, I'm so sorry that you went through all all of this it's 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 a horrific story and i i really don't want you to to, to feel that anybody's laughing at you. Do you is that something that you s still feel you know it's funny because that's what kept me from telling my story publicly for a long time i wanted to help people way back when i was in my late 20s i had been asked to speak about my story to a little like a book club of women and i did and other little things here and there. But I always thought, you know, people will think I was so dumb um, for believing this. But over time, I actually, now that I'm an expert on grooming, and I know how grooming happens, how all of the factors were put in place before he ever kidnapped me, all the trust, all the science fiction movies, everything that was there that looked innocent was all a ruse. And now that I understand that, I'm not as worried. Some people will, will, they're going to criticize you no matter what that happens. But, but for the most part, I really overcame that fear because I knew what was true. I know it. It doesn't matter if you don't know it. Maybe you've never been conned. Maybe you've never been groomed. Maybe you've never had a moment in your life where you were like, oh my gosh, I made that bad decision because I thought this person was trustworthy or I thought that that vacuum would, would solve all my cleaning needs. Whatever it is that conned you, maybe you haven't made the connection between, oh, that sales pitch, that con man, that's what happened to her and her family. But but for the most part, I, I really am not too afraid of that. I just know that it's a, you know, it's a really outlandish story, unless you grew up in the 70s where UFO sightings were in the paper and your parents and, and Birchtold, the man who kidnapped me, uh, are talking about, could this be, you know, people coming now from other worlds and other universes, the gathering of Israel, they would use certain terms he would use certain terms that were familiar to me from a religious standpoint in the narrative. And that made it for a little 9, 10, 11 year old who was just overhearing this conversation. It made it like, 
oh, maybe that is what's happening, you know, because they inculcate, it's it's that inculcation of something familiar, and then they twist it, which is literally what the, the story of my having a child to save a dying planet also was. It was inculcating the Joseph, Mary, and Jesus story that was very familiar to me. We acted it out every Christmas. And taking that same story and twisting it into and inculcating it with this other, this other information or this whatever you call this plan. And so that's a big part of the story of brainwashing and the story of grooming. So uh, as I was um, just telling you about that miracle when that boy bought me the ice cream and I thought something horrible was going to happen, I remember rushing back to my dorm room and just throwing myself on my little bed thinking, oh no, please, please, I, I didn't know he was going to do that, talking to the aliens, you know, above me that were watching me. I didn't know that would happen. And my parents called me every day of this, you know, theater camp because it was about two hours away from our home. And of course, they were very worried about letting me go, but they knew theater was kind of saving my life. They knew something had happened to me, but they didn't know what. And so I'm at the camp and this has happened and and mom and dad call as they always do that evening. And I'm like, what, what's going on? How is everybody, you know, acting like, tell me who's dead. You know, they don't know this. And mom says, well, I had to take Tiffy, our dog, to the doctor because she got, uh, she was convulsing. She was like throwing up so hard. And I was like, oh no, oh no, it's my fault. And she's like, what are you talking about? It's not your fault. I said, what about Bandit, the other dog? Well, she seems okay, a little groggy or like maybe she's sick too, but I think I must have fed them something bad, says mom. Well, I, in my mind, will immediately, you connect all those dots that it's my fault. I let this boy do this, and now I'm in trouble, and my dogs are going to be dead by morning. So I have this kind of tearful cover-up. Oh, okay. Oh, I hope they're okay. Please call me. Tell me how they're doing. Okay, I love you. Is Susan home? Yes. Is Karen okay? Yeah, we're all good. Dad's here. You know, it's the, it's the weekend. Everybody's going to be okay. Everybody's fine. You know, not knowing what's going on in my head, the weight of the world on my shoulders. So I call, um, or I tell them to call me the next morning. They call me back, which is not customary. It's usually in the evening that they would call. But they called me the next morning, and it was a Sunday morning. And Mom said, you seem so upset, Jannie. And I want you to know that, that the dogs are fine. Uh, Tiffy's doing really well. Bandit, whatever was, you know, groggy or lethargic, she's running around like normal. Everything is fine. And I just wanted you to know that you seem so upset. And at that moment, here is the moment for 10 seconds, I had a thought, oh my gosh, is this real? Are they real? Before I kill myself and before I tell Susan about the mission and kill her, I better find out if this is real. Because that plan was already in place. I was going to finish the theater camp, which my birthday, my 16th birthday, was during the theater camp, finish the show, and then that's what I was going to do. Kill my sister if she didn't want to do the mission, and then kill myself. That 10-second thought is what opened the door to me testing the waters. And this is a year and a half after the second kidnapping, mind you. I've been under this influence of brainwashing for another year and a half. So I start testing the waters. I go back home. I don't respond to uh, seeing Birch told at the theater camp. He has this person who's handed me a note. He wants to meet me off campus. I don't respond. I don't go. Nothing happens. I go home. I start school. I'm in high school now. I've turned 16. I've never been on a date. I've never even talked to a boy, practically. I accept a date to the homecoming dance that we're going as a group, a group date. I'm terrified. I know that if I can get through that date and come home and have my family intact, and that's exactly what happened. And my dad was waiting up for me in his chair as I came home from my first date and I literally walked through the door and he was in the dark. He had fallen asleep in his chair. It was dark. 
I walk through the door of my home and he says, Janny, how was it? Did you have a good time? Now, mind you, I've barely spoken to or touched my dad since the second kidnapping. Barely, because I'm not supposed to. I went over and I literally sat on his lap as a 16-year-old girl and hugged him and said, yes, I had a great time, Dad. It was so much fun. Sorry. And then I told him a little bit about the date and what we did and all my friends, my girlfriends that were with me on that group date that loved me through all of this, as did my family, without knowing why I was acting so weird and strange. And I went back to my bedroom, which had been moved to the upstairs. I couldn't sleep in my downstairs bedroom anymore. It was the old den <laughs> upstairs. And I laid on the bed on top of the covers, and I was in shock. I was literally in shock. I'm like, I passed Susan's room. There she was in her bed asleep. Mom was in, in mom and dad's room in bed asleep in that same hallway. I knew Karen was downstairs perfectly fine in her room. And I just sat there, literally. I knew I put these here for a reason. <laughs> literally in shock. My thought was, now what do I do? Now what do I do? Who am I? If I'm not saving a dying planet, do I tell people? What do I say? It was so overwhelming, I can't even describe. And it took a while before I got it out when my best friend Caroline and my sister Karen cornered me, having found some notes that Birch told had written to me earlier in the years that I had hidden in the cushion of my big sofa chair, hanging chair down in my old bedroom as they were making it into a new bedroom so that I could sleep down there again, decorating and painting and changing things. All Everybody so good to me. And that's when I was then cornered and started to talk about it first to Caroline and Karen, and then to mom and dad. And slowly I talked about the sexual assault that had happened, but it took me a long time to get those words. I was still just 16 and scared and didn't know if I, if it was my fault. I literally went to my, my religious leader and confessed that I had done this terrible thing. And lucky for me, he was a good, he was a good bishop. <laughs> And he practically crawled across his desk and threw his arms around me and said, oh, my word, no, you didn't do anything wrong. Nothing that happened to you is, is for anything for you to be feeling bad about or ashamed of. And I'm so sorry. And we love you. And that was a lucky moment for me. Not all religious leaders would have been the same. Do you think that, I mean, when, when it all started with the alien story, I mean, I, I'm telling you, if I woke up drowsy and all that kind of thing and heard that at that kind of age 10 11 12 i believe that a hundred percent i would be like oh my god yeah absolutely do you think as the years went by and you got to about 16 do you think there was maybe one a small side of you that knew that maybe this isn't right but to to admit that would be to acknowledge what was really going on which was far darker than it, than it just too dark to confront at that age yeah, I do think that, you know, getting into high school and just that much older, definitely having other experiences, at least around me, even if I wasn't participating, I had a best friend who was dating and having the time of her life. And, you know, and I was kind of living vicariously through her. And, um, you know, I, I knew even earlier, because she'd been my best friend since I was nine as well. You know, we'd read the health books and looked at all the pictures <laughs> together. You know, we I knew enough about um, all of, you know, reproductive uh, things to, to have a, at least a working knowledge, if I were human, <laughs> what that would be. So yes, I think there was a part of me that certainly 
wanted it not to be true, but the fear was too great. I was too afraid that what if I challenged it, them, and all of a sudden my sister really did disappear. My other sister was blind. My dad was dead. I mean, there were many things that happened in between where Birch told had people burn my father's store to the ground. The entire building and that block in Pocatello, Idaho is gone. He set fire through these two arsonists that he paid. And so that had happened right after the second kidnapping. So I'm believing I did something wrong there again. Like it was me. It was my fault. Somehow I must not have followed the rules. So your brain, when you're in a state of being manipulated and brainwashed, your brain fills in the blanks. He doesn't even have to tell you that anymore. To the question that you asked me, yes, I do think that that I was just old enough and starting to, to have some place in my brain a question like, is this real? Are they real? You know, and it's getting later in the 70s, and I don't see as much of the talking about UFOs and Roswell, mostly because Birch told isn't at my home, you know, because he was the one that did all of that, you know, so. And to, to compound everything, uh, I think back then, people didn't even use the word pedophile, did they? It was before my birth kind of thing. It was a completely different. It was like a dirty old man, they said in the UK, at least. So he's a bit yeah. of a dirty old man. Was it similar over there? Yes, very similar. And of course, the dirty old man has a, an immediate image that comes to mind. It certainly didn't look like this guy who looked as clean cut and he's a businessman, he's a father and a husband of five children, you know, and it's like, certainly he, he isn't a dirty old man. There would never be that thought in my parents' mind, especially because my dad and he went to, you know, Rotary Club and the Chamber of Commerce meetings together. You know, dad owned a flower shop. He owned a furniture store. He just knew exactly how to build that trust. So yeah, they, they knew what a child molester was, but even my FBI agent at that time was a new young FBI agent, and he even said, could he be like, uh, oh, I think the word is pedophile, and, and they said, what's that? And he said, well, you know, like a child molester, but I'll have to go look it up in the handbook to tell you the exact definition. I mean, you know, child abuse laws didn't even exist in 1974 in the United States. They hadn't even been adopted state by state. They were just being talked about through through the House and Senate and the federal government. Child abuse laws. People don't get it. Like, well, why didn't there why wasn't there better counseling? Because there were no counselors, because there was no crime, because it hadn't been put in place. I mean, there were counselors, but if you saw a counselor, we weren't talking mental health. That word hadn't even happened. We were talking, you must be crazy if you're seeing a counselor. It was such a shameful thing. So interesting, <laughs> different time. Do you think that your story uh, perhaps stands out from others of child sexual abuse uh, because he also um, had affairs with, with both of your parents, your mom and your dad? Yes. So I think that that is a, an, a really interesting question because the affair that he had with my mom, which happened in between the two kidnappings, the three or four times that he that she actually slept with him, um, became this big, um, what I think the documentary leaves unsaid is that he was working on everybody, right? He's leading everybody, divide and conquer, separately d designing a, a special relationship with mom when dad's at work, with dad when dad's at work, let's go to lunch, Bob. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let me open up my personal stories to you. Let me have your complete empathy. Let me tell you why I'm not in love with my wife. Why do we do this married thing? Why don't we go get our own bachelor pad, you know, and getting dad to talk about things that I don't think he talked to anybody else about, you know, about his twin brother and his cousins and, you know, things that they did as kids or as young teens and, you know, like he would pull things out of people with his own emotional um, telling of his own stories of of abuse or oh oh this lady that I you know knew when I was seventeen and you know he would 
he just knew how to get people to be so close to him that he could lead them down that path because the masturbation experience that happened with my dad and him in that car was a one-sided experience. And it was just my father, you know, helping out a friend and then feeling guilty about this thing that happened, this masturbation act for the rest of his life. Like, why would I have ever done that other than the fact that he could make you feel like you were, you know, 16 years old. <laughs> That's the truth. And so it's really interesting to me how my parents were so honest and brave to tell those things because it's a tactic that a lot of manipulators do use. They figure out how to divide and conquer, how to get everybody worrying about their own, um, their own feelings that they know they shouldn't have and their own actions that they know they shouldn't have done and get them in that place. And then they're even more likely not to be looking at this guy in any other way other than, oh, I made this stupid mistake with this person and why would I do that? You know, and my dad's thing was before the first kidnapping, that masturbation thing was before the first kidnapping. And my dad never let him back in our house or had any relationship with him 